Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. We're going to wait about another 30, 40 seconds and we'll get going. We have an action pack program. And I see some familiar faces here. It's good to see some of you here. Great, great. Okay, let's get this show on the road. Uh, good afternoon and welcome uh, on behalf of the diversity, uh, equity, um, and inclusion leadership council, we'd like to officially welcome you to our observance day of National Disability Independence Day. It is to celebrate it today, and in honor of that, we decided to put together what we think is an extraordinary program, and we are pleased to have an extraordinary guest um, to help us with this. So. I want to thank you for each one of your time and your interest in learning about this important subject matter. And I think we have a fantastic program today and uh, can't wait to get into it and can't wait to introduce you guys to our uh, uh, speaker. So with that, I'm going to ask our co-chair of our Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Leadership Council, Kevin uh, Scott, who is also the manager of Blue Card Operations to moderate the program and Kevin it is all yours my friend awesome thank you uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr Christine Ferkins uh, Dr Ferkins is an account executive for the virtual interpreting department at Convo Communications uh, through her role at Convo Christine works with companies to be more inclusive and accessible for deaf and hard of hearing employees and customers Additionally, she has taught deaf studies and ASL courses in higher education for 15 years. Christine earned her Bachelor of Arts degree in deaf studies, her master's degree in dis interdisciplinary studies, focusing on communications, deaf studies and linguistics, and her doctorate of education degree in educational leadership and policy studies. Christine is going to discuss uh, different types of accessibility how to diversify your talent pipeline to include people with disabilities and how to make the workplace more inclusive and accessible for deaf employees. So welcome Dr. Ferkins and thank you for joining us as we acknowledge National Disability Independence Day. Hello, thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, it's been it's just an honor to come and talk to you all today. Um, as the instruction said, my name is Dr. Christine Perkins. This is my name sign, the C on the chin, Christine, and I work for Convo Communications. We are a virtual sign language interpreting agency that specializes in workplace solutions for companies who have employees that are deaf or who serve deaf clients. Um, as was mentioned, I taught in the deaf studies program at California State University Northridge for almost 15 years before I came here. Uh, I am a deaf individual, uh, as is my sister. Both of our parents are hearing, so they had to learn a whole new world along with my sister and I. So I'm extremely grateful to my parents. Uh, they really fought to ensure that I had access in the school system, and they also prepared me for the workplace. I do want to start off by telling you all a little bit of a story. You know, I was a very, very bright student. I was interested in a lot of different things when I was in college, and one of them was marine biology. I, con I actually contemplated in majoring in marine biology and working in a lab, but my biggest fear was having to fight for accommodations and being the only deaf individual in the workplace. I knew that was something that wouldn't really make me happy. I wanted to pick a major that I would be around deaf folks and not have to constantly fight for my accommodations. So I ended up teaching deaf studies in higher education. If we fast forward about 10 years after that and two children later, my youngest happened to be born deaf, much like myself, 
And as a parent, I want everything for my children. And I want my youngest child to be able to choose whatever major they want without having to worry about being the only deaf individual in the workplace or not worrying about fighting for accommodations. And that's why I chose to make the switch from academia to the private sector. I wanted to work with companies to be able to provide more accessibility for deaf folks out in the world. Now, you may be wondering what that accessibility is and why companies should incorporate accessibility. I view accessibility as being able to use and understand. Right? And that fits in with three different types of accessibility, right? There's visual, there's motor accessibility, and there's auditory accessibility. Now, with increased access, and increased understanding, it makes it easier to figure out how to make things accessible for everyone. According to a Forbes 2020 article, by number, people who have disabilities are the lar largest minority group. So accessibility does in fact matter. Really, everyone benefits from accessibility. Accessible design improves access to information for individuals with as well as without disabilities. It leads to an improved reputation as well as brand image. It leads to increased cu uh, customer loyalty as well as an improved employee experience and better employee retention. For instance, as a deaf person, I loathe going to places where there are announcements and there's nothing in place for me to read those announcements. It could be a place like a coffee shop, the airport, or trains or bus stations. I actually just went to a conference last week where I had a notification by text related to my flight. I do not miss the days of having to sit right at the front row of the gate and stare every time somebody had an announcement, wondering if it was an important announcement, wondering if my flight was delayed, or not knowing what was going to happen. Having that text notification benefits me, but it does in fact benefit everyone. If the environment is too noisy, everyone may miss that announcement, right? You may be on an important phone call when that announcement comes up, right? Having an accessible screen in place, you know, makes that accessible for everyone. So if I were to go into a pharmacy or a coffee shop, right, and I give my order, a text board that displays my name when my order is ready, would ensure that I would continue to go to that coffee shop or that pharmacy to get my services. I will patron shops that are more accessible to me than ones that aren't. So this type of thing is all encompassing and this type of access benefits everyone. So we see an increased visibility nowadays of sign language and sign language interpreters. And some people ask me, why isn't captioning enough? Right? It doesn't seem that folks know that there's this differentiate, differentiation in the deaf population where a lot of folks experience language deprivation. 90% of, of deaf people are born to hearing folks and don't have access to an, ex to an accessible language. Now, commonly in the medical profession, they advise parents to go ahead and seek out hearing aids, cochlear implants, and the like for their deaf child. But what is typically advised is to, yeah, what, what is, it's typically advised to incorporate sign language much later on in life but to focus on spoken language to see if the deaf child can acquire it. And if not, 
then sign language is often the fallback or the backup option. Now, what most parents don't know is that there is actually a crucial window during the first five years of the child's life in terms of acquiring language while the brain is still in development. After that crucial period, if a child has not been exposed to an accessible language, they will never have full proficiency of any language. There are a number of deaf adults who suffered from language deprivation who typically read at a third grade level and struggle to understand a written language. So sign language provides greater accessibility for the deaf community. So we see more and more companies forming DEI goals, yeah. diversity, equity, and inclusion. However, I read one article from the Harvard Business Review in 2020 that stated an interesting finding from the Return on Disability Group. The finding was that 90% of companies claim to prioritize diversity, but only 4% consider disability in their diversity and inclusion initiatives. So I want to tie this in with a report that was published in 2019 by the National Deaf Center on Post-Secondary Outcomes. Now, they talk about the employment gap between deaf and hearing people in the United States as a significant area of concern. In 2017, only 53.3% of deaf people were employed compared to 75.8% to that of their hearing peers. Now that's an employment gap of 22.5%. Now that high of a number is very concerning. Deaf people can bring a unique perspective to the workplace, but many companies don't even know where to start in terms of providing an accessible environment. So I have some action items for your consideration. The first is to start by understanding the barriers that discourage people from, with disabilities from applying to work for you. It could be, for example, the application format. It could be your, the, the accessibility of the online portal or even the language used in your job descriptions. I can remember applying for several jobs after I graduated from college. You know, I can remember being extremely nervous when having to request an interpreter to have an interview. I felt that that would decrease the likelihood of getting employed. And in some situations, that actually was the case. Having a statement such as, if accommodations are needed during an interview, whether it be captioning or a sign language interpreter, please email us at the company HR email address. And just having that statement shows that you are open, open to hiring deaf people. And as I mentioned earlier, I work for Convo. Convo is a sign language interpreting agency. And I do want to emphasize that Convo does provide free sign language interpreting services for any job interviews you may have with a deaf candidate. Because of the low employment rates within the deaf community, that is one of our ways of educating companies on how to be more accessible and showing how easy it really can be in including interpreters in your interviews and meetings. Another thing is in order to retain employees, accessibility and inclusivity must be extended after the hiring process as well. I've seen situations happen where companies include interpreters for the interview process and stop all accommodations once the job begins. People with disabilities need to feel included and comfortable, and this applies to everyone in the workplace. So having a plan on how to accommodate employees with certain disabilities and make the workplace as a whole more inclusive is really important. This means having access to resources to assist with this plan. 
Several companies have contracted with us to provide interpreting services in case they have any deaf candidates to apply for a job. We have thus far identified them in helping develop a plan. So if they have a deaf candidate that does interview and is hired, they're not left scrambling at the last minute to figure out how to make the best accommodations possible and have a plan in place. Now I've worked for places that have limited budgets and as a team, we make it work. For important meetings, we bring in certified interpreters. For the meetings that are less important, we worked with a local interpreting education program and we use some of their top student interpreters. And we also use the phone, right? With whatever apps would provide spoken a speech to text translation. And my coworkers would download the same app. But what mattered the most was their desire and willingness to be inclusive of me and their willingness to go the extra mile to do so, to take the time to gesture, to write things out, to learn a little bit of sign language, to be able to communicate with me. And we ended up making a wonderful team with a variety of perspectives and that's what made me feel included. So in sum, inclusive businesses are a magnet for talent. And employees with disabilities have different ways of thinking about problems and how to approach solutions to those problems. But the key is to have a plan of how to be inclusive and implement that plan. So, that is, in short, my soapbox presentation to you all. Um, I'd like to open it up to questions. Awesome, Dr. Ferkins. Uh, I will check with uh, Frank to find out if there are any questions in the uh, in the Q and A section. And while folks are uh, providing those questions, I will start with. Uh, a question, though my my stats and data are a little different. I think I I, I read from a, a 2021 article, but 96% uh, of companies uh, in this report are are flexible, have fl flexible work options, uh, making certain tasks uh, more accessible for th those they need to accommodate. Um, my question, I guess, in this effort is, what efforts do you feel? are being made to advocate for deaf or hearing impaired community uh, to companies like a CVS or a Starbucks or a Safeway? For, and you're talking about for their customer base or for their employees? Yes, uh, both customers and, and employees. Okay. Uh, now, I can't speak to uh, CBS uh, and these other companies in terms of their their policies, specifically in terms of how they work with people with disabilities, specifically the deaf community. But what we do see often in things like job descriptions, we never see mention of accommodations during the interview. So deaf folks will not even apply for a job if they're unsure they're going to be denied a request for an interpreter. So they will more than likely apply to a company that says we will provide an interpreter for interviews or that has a deaf employee already. If you have a deaf employee that raises the likelihood of you know another deaf employee interviewing. Um, and what we see happening in the community is a large amount of the deaf community starts applying to one company, right? We would love to see it more spread out. So it's not one company that's getting all the deaf candidates because they're more accessible, but having the deaf community know that you know all of these companies are accessible, whether that company, uh, if, if it's a nonprofit organization posting on their website, uh, letting folks know we are open to hiring people with disabilities, getting that word out to the community. Uh, so that way deaf, deaf folks do understand, oh, this company is open. They're, they're willing to provide an interpreter for the interview. They're going to be more inclusive. There needs to be that transparent upfront discussion. I cannot tell you how often I have walked into a store where I am trying to find something 
especially in times of the pandemic where people are wearing a mask and you can't lip read, folks do not know how to interact with a deaf person. And I find myself oftentimes becoming frustrated and trying to just have a simple interaction. And folks, you would be surprised at how many people just increase their volume thinking if I just speak louder, <laughs> they're going to understand me, but that's just not going to do anything. It doesn't matter how loud you are. I can't hear you. So write it down, try to gesture. Um, but just thinking volume is the one thing that's going to happen. You know, it's the same phrase, just louder and louder and louder, <laughs> I think tends to show the deaf community, um, you know, we really are thinking about how to be inclusive, right? And I think that's what we see is missing. That's interesting. It's a great segue because I was wondering in a scenario like that, um, you know, how would someone, you know, approach or have a conversation with someone who is hearing impaired, you know, you know, like how do you get their attention? Obviously, you, could, you don't want to invade someone's bubble, so to speak. So, you know, is it, is it a tap on the elbow? Is it a tap on the shoulder? Or is it a, you know, is, is it a wave? You know, how, how does one do that? Yes, yes, absolutely. So first of all, just to clarify the terminology hearing impaired. Mm -hmm. In general, the deaf community dislikes the term hearing impaired. They would okay. prefer to be called deaf or hard of hearing cool. in general. And now obviously I do not speak for everyone. Um, but the, the terminology hearing impaired gives the impression that there is something lacking or that there is something there that is less than, right? Our, because our hearing is impaired, we are less than. But oftentimes the deaf community does not feel that way. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie The Matrix, right? You know, there's the red pill, the blue pill, right? Do you want to know? Do you not want to know? Yeah. So if I was given an option, of the red pill, where I were to stay deaf, or the blue pill, I were to become hearing, I'm gonna be honest with you, I'm gonna take the red pill. That's who I am, I'm a deaf person. I cannot imagine life as a hearing person. I have a fantastic life as a deaf person. I have fantastic friends as a deaf person. And so I think you know, we, we are proud of that identity. So I think that's why we are very much okay with, yeah, we're deaf, we're, so not necessarily hearing impaired, okay? Uh, now, sorry to go off on that tangent no, to get fine. back to your question. <laughs> if, you know, so for example, if I'm on my phone and somebody at the store is trying to get me to move out of their way or something, right? And obviously I'm not responding to the auditory signal, just touching me on the shoulder, a light, you know, two, three taps on the shoulder, that is absolutely fine. And then the deaf person will look at you. Um, be prepared after that. Right. So you may want to have something written out or you may want to have an idea of what you want to gesture or mine. Like if you're asking them to move, you may want to say, like, you, you know, just kind of like move your arms in front of you. Or if there's boxes you're trying to get through, pointing to the boxes or even having something typed out on your phone, you know, in a notes app. Do you need any help? You know, just thinking of ways of communicating that are other than spoken language. Thank you. Thank you. And and this is, I think, what we've done uh, throughout our existence uh, at Blue Cross Blue Shield as far as a, as a council is concerned, you know, is to learn, you know, new things, you know, as far as, you know, considering someone differently abled or now the new terminology is just deaf or hard of hearing. So, I mean, hearing impaired now is out of my vocabulary. <laughs> Uh, and <laughs> thank you, thank you. Kevin, we have two questions here. Okay. Um, one is from. Let's go back here. I think it was from Monique. I'm hard of hearing. Are there any accommodations for people who are not deaf within the workplace? Because besides closed caption, that are not accurate. Yes, there are companies that provide real-time catch, 
captioning services, which means you hire someone to provide the captioning. And 99% of the time, the captions are accurate. And that is a service called CART, C-A-R-T. You can do that. Uh, those services can be accommodated with Zoom, Microsoft Team, any apps. There typically is a lot of errors. Uh, the 90, the 90, the errors are typically about 6%, but that 6% of errors can cause a multitude of misconceptions. Um, we have in, we have meetings using a certified interpreter, meaning we should also have CART services for someone who is incorporated in the Zoom meetings to provide accurate captioning. That is another form of accommodations. And Kevin, we have another question from Sherry. Do you have any recommendations to help with providing an environment of inclusivity for hearing impaired during this time when we are mostly working remotely? So for example, I work for Convo. We are a deaf owned and deaf run company. Most of our employees are deaf and sign. However, we also have hearing employees who don't know any sign language. Most of us work remotely and are working from home, so we are actually a perfect example of how to include individuals. So for example, Slack. It's like a text system. It's great for the company where you're able to send messages internally. So you can send messages back and forth via Slack. We also have staff interpreter who are ready, staff interpreters who are ready to jump into a meeting. So if you have a hearing employee who does not know sign, we have interpreters available to be in the meetings. And we also have videos recorded videos that are sent via slack sometimes it's easier to just sign a message because that's our natural language so we upload those videos on slack but we also include a transcript of that signed video for our hearing employees that don't know sign so it's actually the opposite we are inclusive of our hearing employees that don't know sign for a company that is sign language, sign language centric. So we, if we're having any type of dialogue, asking about somebody's weekend, it's not just about work, you know? Having that relationship, developing that relationship and showing that you're willing to communicate, whether that's via Zoom meeting with captionings, text, but just showing that you're open to communicate in a different method is how, is how we incorporate our employees. Awesome, this is from Linda Jimenez. Uh, within an organization, how would you suggest building support for disability focused employee groups? I would recommend that you reach out to different nonprofit organizations that actually specialize in that disability. So for example, uh, we have deaf architects that build with, with windows that have you know regular window covering so that the light is not just glaring into their eyes. We rely heavily on visual cues. So if we can't see a person due to lighting, there's different ways where you can design uh, accommodations for those with disabilities. Sometimes it can be a bit overwhelming. You know, you might have someone who's deaf, blind in a wheelchair. There's 
all of these individuals, all of these disabilities require different accommodations. So I would reach out to different nonprofit organizations that specialize in that disability for maybe cons consulting services. We as a company, you know, this is what we do. How can we change to be more accommodating for this type of disability? So you must do your homework, research the different disabilities and how you can merge and inc include make how you can merge and in, in include employees to make an inclusive culture. So Kevin, we have several questions from our Q&A box. One is from Susan. I uh, think Susan, this was addressed. I don't know if it 100% answered your question, uh, but I'm happy to read your question. It did. OK, so the next question is from Ed. Are there organizations that facilitate employment networking for deaf and disabled individuals? Well, there are several nonprofit agencies that do market or promote job positions, different companies that provide interpreting services. So I would definitely reach out to the different nonprofit organizations that specialize in specifically deaf individuals. Also universities with a big deaf pop population like Gallaudet University in Washington, DC, California State, Northridge in California, RIT in New York. There are several big universities with a large deaf population. So if you're looking to hire or have internships, you can reach out to those universities. And really, it just starts with one one place. You can email and say, hey, I need help. And many deaf organizations are more than happy to answer any questions and meet with you, send information. As a deaf community, we are very small. We know people from Washington, California, New York, DC, so the odds that you are reaching out to a deaf person and needing help, they will be more than happy to work with you. Many times we see companies who are willing to spread the news. And so then we end up being very happy because you want to reach out and incorporate our deaf community. We're definitely going to be happy to, to accommodate that. Uh, Ed's other question is, and I'll paraphrase it, uh, how easy is it to learn sign language versus learning to learn Spanish or French? Um, well, as a teacher, uh, instructor of sign language, I've noticed either you can pick it up and acquire the language relatively easily, or you don't. <laughs> it's a different modality. <laughs> Many hearing people are used to hearing and being reliant on their on auditory cues. They're not used to actually dissecting information with their eyes. And having the physical signs, sign language has a lot of layers. It's not just sign. We use face, we use facial expressions. Uh, our shoulders, if we're trying to make our space small, our signing space, we use a lot of, it's, it's a lot of spatial use. Um, if we, if I just bought a house and I want to describe my new setup, I would be describing my couch over here with my beautiful windows and just describing the whole thing in my own space. That visual space has so many layers with facial expressions and everything. It's very hard for some hearing individuals to pick it up and to think about and incorporate all of those different things at once. <laughs> That's interesting because I think, you know, from I'll just say the the hearing community, I think that that also applies as well. Or, you know, I know personally, I use my hands a lot and, you know, facial expressions. My wife says I talk with my face a lot. So, uh, or I roll my eyes out loud. <laughs> so, um, exactly. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's almost, you know, that's one parallel, you know, that, 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 that's universal. Um, here's a question for you, Dr. Ferkins. What's, maybe... go ahead. Mm -hmm. 
you might actually acquire sign language faster than somebody else because you're already uh, you're already using your facial expression so it might not throw you off as much i'm down i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna work on that <laughs> uh what speech to text applications do, would you recommend uh, maybe the the top two or three if, if you know of any The deaf community really likes Cardzi, C -A Cardzilla, C-A-R-D-Z-I-L-L-A. I know it's an app that you can speak to your phone and it will translate it to text. Once you shake the screen, that text will actually disappear and then the deaf person can type to respond back. And then you shake it, that text disappears, then it's the other person's turn to speak. So it's easy to take turns in using that app. Otter is a popular one for speech to text. Um, however, it's for a deaf person to chime in. You might have to actually use the note section in your phone. So you'll have two separate devices using both apps, which is why Cardzilla is pretty popular because it can do both. We'll segue with that. Um, is Convo working or any other organizations working with uh, maybe the more tech firms or other organizations uh, to make uh, communication? Um, easy or more accessible, you know, for, you know, for communicating. Actually, there are several deaf people who are working at Microsoft, Google and those sorts of companies, and they're actually working within the accessibility team and they do include several of their ideas and Apple has several designs that actually are beneficial for the deaf community because of the deaf employees and and what they have to offer and it's really nice to help the deaf community having that perspective involved all right frank that any questions that i missed or anything like that i or? do just want to explain out uh in terms of uh the card company mazda Right. I don't know if you know, but there is they have a stereo system, right? Where the, and where they've placed the speakers, they've designed the speakers in the car uh, to, with basically a science behind it. And uh, they, you know, I was reading this article and there was an engineer, I guess, in this position who happened to be a coda. He was a child of deaf adults. So his parents were deaf and had seen time and time again. Um, you know, being in the car with his parents, you know, his parents trying to crank up the volume so that they can feel the beat and the vibrations in the car. So this Coda, who grew up with this experience, wound up designing for Mazda where to put their speakers to have the best sound experience for deaf people in a Mazda. And so, again, it's this idea of having a unique perspective, right? So this person who grew up with deaf parents had this perspective that was unique. He brought it to this company who then revolutionized the way they put speakers in the car so that it's more inclusive for deaf people. Yeah, that's awesome. Are any other car companies uh, mimicking that or following up? Do you do you know? I don't know. I do not know that. Um, that yeah, that's definitely something I would need to look into. Awesome. But yeah, I, I I had seen the article and I thought, wow, this is this is just great. Here's a question for you, Dr. Ferkins. Um, what do you believe the difference between a disability program and a diversity program? So this is a really good question. Um, I think diversity programs are going to focus in on race, ethnicity, 
gender, sexual orientation, um, and those are typically prioritized. Disability isn't really looked at as a, a group in diversity. It, they aren't really emphasized, right? Disability programs really do emphasize and focus in on disability, right? But that, you know, race is still considered a part of that. You know, the race, it, people are intersectional, right? And we recognize that both of those identities may be a priority. It's interesting because I believe the, the the program that I attended when we met was at the, uh, of course, I'll just say within Blue Cross Blue Shield, we use DEI. And then the, the program that I attended was IDEA. So, it, it, you know, there was still a piece in there where there was accessibility included in that. Uh, so it was very specific uh, to that. So that's what made me think about the question um, based off you know, just just the way the majority of the companies <clears throat> utilize um, diversity versus, for what it's worth, excluding accessibility. But to to Frank's point during our conversation we had was the inclusion piece of it is supposed to include those uh, everyone, so to speak. Um, but to your point, you know, that there's there's a little there's a difference there. So Kevin, we have a question from Linda. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Within an organization, how would you suggest building support for disability focused employee groups? Building support for disability employee focused. groups? Oh yeah, employee groups, affinity groups, employee groups, whatever. So providing more support for folks within dis folks who have disabilities within those groups. That is that is what correct. you mean? Yes. I have seen companies much like you are now bringing folks in uh, to talk to you specifically about people with disabilities. Oftentimes when you get people together in the workplace, Folks are scared to ask questions. They they want to know, but they don't want to offend, right? So oftentimes great ways to educate, you know, learning about all of these different disability groups is to bring in different speakers within the ERG. Maybe having, you know, a 20 minute session on folks who are deaf, people, you know, who are using wheelchairs, blind folks. And that provides this comfort of like, okay, it's okay to ask questions like today. It's okay to be open and ask these questions. Uh, and having that, you know, open dialogue is the first step of providing support. It's the first way of seeing like, oh, these people want to support me and want to know about me and my disability. I welcome those questions. I feel like you're curious about wanting to get to know me and you are willing to accommodate me feels makes me feel like I'm supported in this process. It's uh, Kevin, if you don't mind, uh, this is a one of my dumb questions. I can't blame this one on anyone else. <laughs> um, oftentimes, <laughs> at the, at, to your point, Bobby, uh, when we are dealing with people with disabilities, um, we don't know what to do. Like when someone's in a wheelchair and they approach a door, should you run in front of them and open the door to help? If someone is, and so, and in, in some cases you do it, people get uh, offended. Some people appreciate the help. You don't know when to jump in, when to stand in the back. Do they expect to be on their own? Should you help them? All those questions to your point, uh, uh, Christine, are very real questions that stop a lot of us from actually getting involved. Uh, but I always feel like not doing something is always the wrong answer, and that may not be the right answer. So. Uh, that hesitancy is definitely there. I, Frank, I tell you, I think sometimes we become sensitive to this idea of can I help? And a lot of times we don't need the help, right? So if we can figure out a way of reframing it. So for example, would you like me to write this down, right? Would you like me to call an interpreter? You know, 
you know, so finding out from the deaf person what it is you want uh, instead of, oh, do you need help? Uh, he, you know, instead of starting with this idea of do you need help, I think it is a bit more making it about me and what I need, right? So if we remove this idea of, oh, you need help, I think we lower the defenses of people with disabilities because we are often trying, times trying to justify our autonomy and showing that we can do it. And sometimes, yeah, it is fantastic to have, you know, an asset, right? So that's how I would view it. So as, you know, in a coffee place, I can remember when I am um, trying to put in a complicated order, you know, my partner loves to add an extra shot of this, you know, if they want a pump of this syrup and that, and I just want a black coffee, but I have to order for my partner. And so if I'm ordering and the cashier, you know, is speaking to me and saying, so you ordered this, 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 and they wind up doing the same thing that I mentioned earlier, they repeat my order back to me just at a higher volume, and then they crank it up to a seven, then an eight, and then a nine. And then I say, look, I am so sorry. I cannot understand you. Can you write it down? Can you repeat this in a different manner? And oftentimes they will still just get louder. And now you, we're just both in a place of frustration and I don't know what to do. Luckily, the person behind me just wrote down in their phone what the person was saying, what the barista was saying. They tapped me on the shoulder and put their phone right in front of my eyes. And all they were saying is, do you need anything else, right? And all that person did was just type out, do you need anything else? And showed it to me and it was like, oh, okay, fine. And I was able to look at that at the barista and answer their question, right? A simple question of, do you need anything else, right? All you had to do was type it out instead of just constantly increasing the volume. But yeah, for me, like, yeah, I appreciated in that moment that ally. And it, it's okay to, when somebody says no, to take no for an answer. If you say, hey, can I help you with this? Can I type this out for you? And if they say, no, I got it. Thank you. I appreciate it. That's it. That's it. Just, you know, taking that answer and, and being fine with it. And in the spirit of allyship, uh, what is it like to have your words translated, you know, by an interpreter? Oh, do you mean like, for example, right now you're saying? Yes. Oh, I, mean, I, I personally love it. I love that more and more companies are in a place to provide interpreting services. You know, I think the idea of like, you know, making sure and saying, hey, do you need this? Right. Because there are many companies that are like, oh, no, we don't know how to do that. We don't know. You know, not going to do it. Sorry. And so, you know, it's like it, it could be something as simple as like wanting to go see a play and knowing that it's not going to be accessible. Right. And I understand that sometimes budget is not going to be in a place to provide interpreters. But there are also ways to be creative and ways to work around it, right? Whether that's working with the local, you know, interpreting education program. And while that may not be the most ideal route, but for a performance at an elementary school, so mom and dad can understand their, their child's play, that's much better than not having anything at all. So, yeah. Okay, well, speaking of entertainment, <laughs> There's an interesting fun fact that most people may or may not know about you, as well as uh, perhaps uh, your previous career. Would you mind sharing that and telling us a little bit about that? Oh, okay, sure, sure. Um, when I was a kid, I was actually involved in, uh, in the movie uh, Speed 2 as well as the TV show, The X-Files. Um, and really how that managed to come about was I was in middle school and we had, uh, I believe it was you know, just a few deaf students um, who, you know, had an, you know, we had an acting coach come in that was basically uh, looking for a deaf actress, a young girl to, act in speed two they had this flyer for the auditions 
And uh, so they, you know, they came to me and said, would you be interested? And I remember being really excited and taking the flyer and bringing it home to my mom. And I was like, mom, please, please, please. I want to do this. And my mom, very skeptical, still was like, okay, why not? So I auditioned and I got the role. And then I auditioned for the X-Files and I got that role. And I was about 13. So I had some fun as a, as a child actor. But 17 was when I stopped. Uh, and I, I stopped in the acting world and really focused in on my education. Awesome. Great segue uh, to, to another question we just received. Um, as a non-native English speaker, I'm very aware that accents are indicative of a lot of, of people's backgrounds. Similarly, are there parallels to accents in sign language and is the American Sign Language more universally adopted than other sign languages across the world? So a two-parter. Oh, just a wonderful, wonderful question. Oh, wonderful questions. So first off, uh, American Sign Language uh, does have accents. So the sign for early uh, is early in Washington state, some sign it early. So it's like this hand shape for three coming off the sign for the head. That's actually the sign for rooster, right? And so obviously a rooster crows early, so it fit into the, to the, the culture. So yeah, in the regions of the United States, there are different signs that would be considered an accent. And that's much like, you know, Southern accents or an accent from somebody from the Northeast, right? Folks from the East Coast typically sign much faster than those who come from the West. We're a bit more laid back, so we sign a little bit slower. Uh, much like, you know, speech, right? There are different ways of signing that, you know, would show that where you are, right? American Sign Language uh, is predominantly used in the United States as well as in Canada. Now, um, except for in Quebec. In Quebec, they use LSQ which is a mixture of French sign language and American sign language. Um, and then uh, obviously in England, they use British sign language, right, which is very different from American sign language. In Australia, they use Auslan or Australian sign language. So yes, if I were to bump into a deaf person in, in England, we would be able to write back and forth because we share that written language, but I can't understand British sign language any better than I could understand Australian sign language, to be honest. So, yeah, there there are differences, and each country has, much like their own spoken language, has their own sign language. You know, Mexico has Mexican sign language. You know, yeah. You know, so each country does very much have their own sign language system. Um, awesome. We have a couple of more questions. Has Convo, the company? Uh, developed any training materials, uh, posters, et cetera, that succinctly conveys awareness, uh, perhaps that we can share or to, to other employees? Yeah, I'm sorry. We're freezing up a bit. Okay. It seems like my Wi-Fi has uh, got a bit of a glitch in it. Would you mind repeating that? Uh, yes, has Convo developed any training materials or do they offer any posters that, that convey awareness uh, for employees or to employees? So we don't have uh, materials that we provide and share out. However, what we do is uh, we're more than willing to present to your company. We definitely provide services that are more fit to what you're looking for. And so we do provide those type of virtual trainings, so to speak. And then there's one more. Can you, sp pardon me, can you speak to the risk of deaf and hard of hearing people's health issues like dementia uh, that can be caused by isolation? There, there is a large uh, 
incidents of the geriatric population of the deaf community where there isn't enough senior housing for deaf individuals, right? There are a few, but a very few, right? And so I think what we see is often there are deaf seniors that are placed in senior housing where they are the only deaf individual, where they are unable to communicate um, with anyone. And so, yes, there is extreme isolation in those cases, and that is a large issue. Um, there need to be more programs that bring these deaf folks together and group them together um, where they're then able to provide different interpreting services for any medical assistance um, or any groups that are provided. I worry about myself as I get older. And I know I'm fortunate enough to have two children, but I don't want to have to depend on them if I have dementia and to be put in an assisted care home where I'm the only deaf person is a scary, scary proposition. And so that's a that's a that's a, a problem that we definitely need a resolution to. Kevin, you're muted. Thank you. Um, lost the question. <laughs> so, so obviously, with that, you know, you know, we should never stop learning uh, in life, especially when we want to master, obviously, our professions, um, and then, of course, communicating <laughs> to all the communities. What would you recommend um, people do? Uh, whether it's at Blue or just in general, to learn more about how we can be better allies and advocates. So uh, I would encourage, you know, downloading a, a number of, there's a number of American Sign Language apps that could teach you some of those introductory vocabulary basics. There's also Gallaudet University, which is a liberal arts university for deaf and hard of hearing students in Washington, DC, that offers free virtual ASL classes through ASL Connect uh, and the ASL Connect program. I would also recommend following a number of deaf influencers on Instagram and TikTok. Um, so if, if you were literally to just type in deaf, uh, there are quite a few influencers on Instagram and TikTok. Uh, that have a few 30 second just clips on how to educate folks on what people should be aware of things like close captioning things like sign language interpreters i think we're seeing more of that on instagram and TikTok and social media in general for the younger generation to be aware of how to be more inclusive of the deaf population awesome well i know we are close at the time so i want to thank dr firkins and especially um, our interpreters, Kalina Anderson, as well as Bobby uh, Lofler. I say it right? Cool. Boom. Yeah. Got it right first time. All right. As well as uh, our, our leadership council, Frank, Michelle, uh, the education team, as well as uh, our monthly observances team. And I want to thank everyone for attending and being a part of this uh, Dr. Ferkus, we're going to be reaching out to you again and again and again for other events. Uh, you know, the hour was was too short. Fantastic. <laughs> and so I wanted to once again celebrate uh, National Disability Independence Day with you and everyone involved and say thank you again for attending. Have a great afternoon. Thank you all so much for including me in this event. It was an honor and I had a lot of fun. Thank you all so much. And thank you to my interpreting team for being able to voice for me. I do appreciate that. Great. Thank right. you. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone.